Okay, so last time we were, we finished up talking about the laws of nature, uh, and then um, we saw a little bit more vocabulary, the idea of an actor and an author, and the picture was that the author is responsible for the action or statement that the actor carries out. And so we should be thinking of the model of, I said, um, the power of attorney, where you grant somebody else the authority to act in your name, you become the author, you become responsible for their actions. And this is exactly the picture that Hobbes is going to use to describe the authorization of the sovereign. So this is the creation, how he describes the creation of a commonwealth. Okay, so, um, we're now up to um, part two of Leviathan, called Of Commonwealth. Here we have chapter 17 of the causes, generation, and definition of a commonwealth. Um, so up until now, we've had our picture of um, our, our sort of underlying metaphysical picture and our account of human beings and our account of human beings in their natural condition, then an account of the laws of nature, which tell us what is rational for us to do. And the answer is going to be on the condition that other people are willing to do so as well. Give up your right of nature, leave the state of nature, enter into a commonwealth. And that's what now we're getting, the picture of the Okay, so Hobbes begins here. Actually, let me pause to see if there are questions. Well, where we are, um, what the argument's been so far. Nothing bothering them. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so, okay, so page 106, beginning of chapter 17. He reviews what we've established, he thinks. So um, he says, the final cause, end, or design of men who naturally love liberty and dominion over others in the introduction of that restraint upon themselves in which we see them live in commonwealths is the foresight of their own preservation and of a more contented life thereby. That is to say, so the reason why people would voluntarily, willingly, put themselves under restrictions, put obligations on themselves, uh, tie themselves with law, give up some liberty. The reason why they would do this is because unless they do that, nobody else would limit themselves, give up, give up their liberty, and we would be in a state of nature which would be bad for everybody. Uh, particular me. Um, okay, so the reason to do this is, in fact, to get other people to do the same, so that each of us can do better. That is to say, the reason is of getting themselves out from that miserable condition of war, which, as I showed you before, was necessarily consequent to the natural passions of men when there's no visible power to keep them in awe and to tie them by fear of punishment to the performance of their covenants and observation of those laws of nature that I just described in the previous two chapters. Because, he says, remember, the laws of nature tell us to get out of the state of nature if we can, on the condition that other people do so as well. So the laws, maybe starting with the third, depending on how you count exactly, they bind in foro interna, not necessarily in foro externa. That is, we can all recognize that it would be rational to comply with these if everyone else does. So we have a desire, it's rational to have a desire to have everyone comply with them. But unless everybody does, that desire is not going to rationally manifest itself in outward behavior. Because unless other people are going to comply with it, it's not rational for me to know. And in the state of 
associated with nature in particular, it's not rational for me to do so because other people are not complying. Okay. Uh, paragraph two, it says, um, for the laws of nature, which are things like justice, equity, modesty, mercy, and in some doing to others as we would be done to, um, of themselves without the terror of some power to cause them to be observed, that is, outwardly in our behavior, are contrary to our natural passions and carry us to partiality, pride, revenge, and the like. Okay, so a commonwealth, he's suggesting here, is necessary in order to put the laws of nature into effect in order to be rational to act outwardly on the basis of these laws of, the, uh, of nature, doing things like acting justly, uh, acting modestly, impartially, fairly, in some observing the golden rule. This is only rational in our outward behavior in a commonwealth. And, sorry, and that's because um, our natural inclination is not to do that. Our natural inclination is to um, carry us to partiality, pride, revenge, and the like. So, um, he says in sort of a grand flourish here, and covenants without the sword are but words, and of no strength to secure a man at all. So we need a commonwealth, we need a sovereign, in order to secure the motivation to get people to comply with these requirements, to get people to comply with the law of nature, laws of nature. And then it will, in fact, be rational to comply with them, because it's rational to comply on the condition that other people do so as well. OK, so I'll say one last time. So we need a commonwealth in order to make these laws of nature rational to act outwardly on um, and to be able to implement them. And it's rational to want that because we will all do better if everybody acts on these laws of nature than if we were still trapped in the state of nature. Is that clear? Yeah. Um, OK, well, so um, why do we need a commonwealth to do this? Over on 107, uh, Hobbes says that basically, as long as we're in the state of nature, we might have what, overlapping shared desires with a few people that we would want to cooperate with. So you can imagine maybe like close family members, something like this, where there's natural inclinations to uh, cooperate there. Um, but such a small number of individuals won't be able to afford any real protection. And on the other hand, in very large numbers, where we actually might be able to have enough strength to protect each other, there's, that's going to be unstable. We're not going to be able to um, coordinate with a great multitude, he says. So this is on 107, he says, nor is it the joining together of a small number of men that gives them enough security. And there can be never so great a multitude, sorry, and be there never so great a multitude, yet if their actions be directed according to their particular judgments and particular appetites, well then they're not going to be able to coordinate with one another and the large group basically won't be able to provide protection. Okay, so over uh, on the bottom of 108, Sorry, the top of 108 up to 109, Hobbes is making the case that um, this process of setting up a commonwealth with laws that are to be enforced is something that we need to do, he says, artificially. That is, it's not something that happens naturally by itself. Um, so artificial here, Artificial does not mean bad or, um, or fake or something. 
he's arguing, of course, that this is the rational thing to do, to set up this artificial um, construction. But he's worrying here, um, he's worrying here that somebody might say, it doesn't take sort of positive deliberation and effort to set up a common self. It's something that would happen naturally or spontaneously, just like in the case with certain social animals. So Hobbes is now going to argue that for several different reasons, we're not like that. We're not like bees who may spontaneously, naturally, based on the natural inclinations and desires that they have, form large communities. Okay, so I'm not going to go all through all of these, all of these reasons why he thinks that human beings have to do this artificially, whereas mere animals do this naturally. I just want to note a few of these reasons on 108 to 99. Um, let's note reason two, most importantly, this is paragraph eight on 108. He says, secondly, that amongst these creatures, so like ants or bees or whatever, amongst these creatures, the common good differeth not from the private. And being by nature inclined to their private, they procure thereby the common benefit. But man, whose joy consisteth in comparing himself with other men, can relish nothing but what is uh, what is an enemy. Okay, so one reason why animals, I mean, maybe the main reason why animals are able to form societies naturally is because nature has given them inclinations and desires that direct, that, that are in agreement with one another, that direct them to the common good. But human beings aren't like that. We have our own desires that conflict with one another and are often in competition with 